well as talking about healthcare sector challenges with a focus on uh, women health issues. Um, so each of our, of our panelists here today uh, represents a very prominent organization and they will be speaking to us more about how um, we are aiming to shift the paradigm uh, of economic empowerment and women's health. Um, so as you know, um, even though we're in the 21st century, still women still face great uh, challenges in order to be um, able to um, contribute to the economy and accomplish um, whatever they actually aim for because of many challenges that they face. So we're going to discuss this with our guests here today and, and we're going to actually provide solutions for all this. Um, but uh, before we begin, I actually would like to thank uh, Organon for hosting us today at their premises. And uh, I would like to give over the mic to uh, Romy Kusa. Um, he is the Associate Vice President uh, for the Middle East, North Africa and Turkey region um, at Organon. So uh, Romy, uh, can you hear us? Yes, yes thank, thank you. you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh, over mic to you. Okay, Th thank you, Nahla, and uh, good, good afternoon, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And gentlemen. Uh, welcome, welcome to our uh, all across the, the region and to our I would like to say a very special thank you to our partners, Flat6 Labs, and UN who are the United Nations entity working for gender equality and the empowerment of women, uh, for their support in co-hosting this Women and Entrepreneurship webinar today. Uh, women empowerment uh, is a term that has been frequently in the last few years uh, heard, but that this is still uh, there's still a big need uh, for effort and collaboration uh, to create impactful, true, meaningful, and innovative outcomes uh, that empower really her at all aspects. Yeah. Today, today we have the honor to, to present this webinar together with women discussing their views and their experience in women economic empowerment and efforts in the elimination of discrimination against women and girls. The empower also together we have flat six labs with us and, and this is at our the Mina the region leading a seed and early stage venture venture capital, capital firm and organon as a healthcare company we're dedicated both to women's health and commit to listen to women's needs and finding the solutions to offer her better and healthier every day we're excited to be part of today's important topic on At Organon, we understand that, that women are foundation to a healthy world. And unfortunately, existing barriers today to women's health mean that around half of the world's population may be facing issues and suffer health problems. These barriers are addressed not only would women uh, be empowered, but we would also enjoy a stronger, healthier, and more resilient society. In fact, according to research conducted by McKenzie, women could add between 12 to 28 trillion dollars, US dollars, to global GDP if their healthcare needs are well better. Today's event will also have the chance to learn more about female entrepreneurship and our Femtech Accelerator program in partnership we was kicked off back in October 2021. It's driven by our goal to innovate across women's healthcare and ultimately to improve women's lives. We're keen to support female entrepreneurs in the startup landscape that can address the existing barriers to women's health, help to improve access and expand healthcare choices. The Middle East and North Africa's MENA Femtech business account for only less than 6%, accurately 5.8% of the global market, which expands, which reflects actually the, the great opportunities and we still have in this area to do a better job to empower more women and advance their health. Unfortunately, as women face barriers to accessing the health care, they still need uh, Extra, extra support, I would say, and more over in, in the space value also that they face in the startup ecosystem as well. From a lack of funding to a lack of understanding of women's health needs, many femtech companies which have the potential to deliver critical innovations needed often fail to get the support they are very much in need for. 
This is where the Femtech Accelerator Program comes in. Selected female-founded digital health startups dedicated to women's healthcare in MENA will receive a wide ranging support to realize and grow their business. Specifically, selected participants will receive funding from Organo or get fast track for investment from select flat six lab offices across MENA, as well as strategic mentorship, entrepreneurship focused business training, and much more. Together with flat six labs, this initiative will critically empower women in the tech and female health and well-being space. With the presence and support of you and women, we will also gain more in-depth insights surrounding the unmet needs and areas that still need more attention to economically power. To conclude, women's economic empowerment and health go hand in hand. The healthier women are, the better they can economically support themselves and their families. The more economically empowered they are, the better they can take care of their health and support and advance productive economies. Simply, gender equity adds to economic growth and prosperity for us all. Thank you for your time and allow me to now hand over to our moderator and panelists to start our discussion. Once again, thank you for your attendance from across the region and a special thank you to our partners and speakers today. Nahla, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rami. Uh, thank you, Rami. Apologies. Thank you, Rami, for your uh, for your great intro and uh, and insightful, actually, introduction. Um, and now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our outstanding panelists with us today. Um, uh, starting off with uh, Noha Salem, uh, Global Women's Health Policy Lead at Organon, uh, Dina Shinufi, uh, Chief Investor Officer at Flat6 Labs, uh, Jailena Masiri, uh, Deputy Country Representative at UN Women in Egypt. So um, I wanted to start off uh, by showcasing the role of our organizations in actually empowering women, uh, serving healthcare sector, um, and, and even contributing to the economy in general. Um, so Noha, if I may start with you, um, could you tell us how Organon is actually shifting the paradigm um, to improve women's health and advance gender equality? Yes, thank you, Nahla. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Tina and Jailan for joining us today and you for moderating the conversation. Yeah. Um, and like Rami said, we're a new company. We just launched back in June 2021, but with a very sole focus on advancing women's health. And this is a very exciting, I would say, vision and mission for us as a company. We recognize that when women rise, the entire community rises as well. Yeah. And we know that we cannot achieve any advancements in women's health without advancing gender equity and that it is critical to achieving our vision which is a better and healthier every day for every woman mm -hmm. and if we look back you know obviously with COVID-19 we all know that it has had a disproportionate impact on women on a variety of areas but we also know that you know it gave us a more I would say profound appreciation for the healthcare sector True. and innovation in healthcare, which helped us, you know, curb the impacts of this pandemic and hopefully bring it to to an end. So, you know, we couldn't think of a better better time to really focus on on women's health, and we really recognize that these are two sides to the same coin. Mm -hmm. um, so from a company perspective, everything that we have done has been really putting women at the center and putting gender equity very closely to that. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been really informing everything that we've been doing. Obviously, you know, from a you know, core to our mission and vision is really how do we harness the power of innovation yeah. um, to support and address some of those unmet needs that are facing women's health. And like you said, you know, half of the population completely underserved for so long yeah. um, with so many unmet health needs, specifically mm -hmm. around, you know, areas that I would say uniquely impact women, but also disproportionately impact women. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of areas that are still not really understood and not enough data out there to help us understand. So what we're bringing as a company is really that focus around putting women at the center, making sure that we harness the power of innovation mm -hmm. so that we can bring those solutions forward and address some of those challenges as well. That's very interesting and, and very delightful, actually. Um, and uh, Jaylan, uh, if you could tell us about UN uh, Women, um, how they're actually supporting women in, in, in contributing to the economy and actually empowering them. 
Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm yeah. really excited to be here today and to be, you know, get to know this amazing um, panel members. Mm -hmm. um, women's economic empowerment is a core objective of UN Women, both uh, corporately as well as the work we do in Egypt. As Rami actually pointed out earlier, research has shown that uh, women's economic empowerment has a multiplier effect that yields mm -hmm positive returns, not just on the women, but her family, the community, and society as a whole. Yeah. Um, our approach um, is a holistic approach that combines working at, on the upstream interventions at the policy level, at the level of the enabling environment, yeah. as well as downstream interventions with the women themselves. We partner with the government, with the private sector, and with civil society organizations, including women's organizations and women business organizations, to uh, accelerate uh, women's economic empowerment. Um, in terms of the work we do, uh, we target specifically women who are unemployed, underemployed, um, women returnees, uh, women who have exited the labor market because of childcare or other uh, reasons and they want to reintegrate in the, in the labor force but don't have the requisite capacities or skills, yeah. uh, women entrepreneurs at different levels, and women uh, graduates of TIVIT. And yeah. we focus specifically on what we call women in the non-traditional sectors, so like mechanics or plumbing or mm -hmm. electricity because of uh, gender stereotypes and also to address the issue of occupational segregation where we see mm -hmm. women and men being segregated in male versus female yeah. occupations and it's actually a key driver of the gender wage gap. So this yeah. is who we focus on. In terms of the work that we do on upstream intervention, we on I would say four four areas. Um, social norms it permeates all the work that we do. So um, addressing some of the cultural and uh, social norms that discriminate against women um, through information, education, and awareness campaigns. Uh, specifically, when it comes to women's economic empowerment, we've had some successful campaigns around engaging men and boys in unpaid care. It's called Because I'm a Man. We've had campaigns around wow. gender stereotypes at work, um, sexual yeah. harassment in the workplace. So these are some of the interventions we do when it comes to uh, those structural issues around social norms. Yeah. We also focus on the policy uh, and legislative environment and this we do it through supporting research and the production of sex disaggregated data that can point to discrepancies. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we uh, have supported the um, American University in Cairo's Women on Boards Observatory annual report yeah. that um, uh, basically points to uh, the percentage and representation of women in corporate boards in Egypt, both mm -hmm. um, for Egyptian companies that are listed on the Egyptian uh, stock exchange, as well as companies that fall under the uh, supervision of the Financial Regulatory Authority. And it basically draws attention to the number and representation of women on board. So that's a, a bit some of the work that we do. We also work a lot on the unpaid care economy, uh, which okay. is a really structural issue as well when it comes to um, women's labor force participation. Um, in the Arab region, um, the uh, responsibility for care falls overwhelmingly on families as opposed to being distributed evenly between the family and the state, mm -hmm. and within families predominantly on women. So in the Arab region around women perform 4.7 times more time on unpaid care work than men. And mm -hmm. that unpaid care work restricts their opportunities to engage in paid work, to engage in higher education. So we work, we support, um, for instance, care services. Mm -hmm. uh, we support public policies that aim to reduce um, and redistribute the amount of care work. So that's a little bit some of the work we do. Mm -hmm. And we also focus on the work that has to do with um, um, sustainable financing, so looking at the extent mm -hmm. to which um, sustainable financing can redirect uh, capital, whether capital in international capital markets or domestic markets, to fund projects that can expand women's economic security. So mm -hmm. that's kind of broadly the work that we do on upstream interventions, and I'll uh, maybe the second round of questions I can talk more specifically what we do with the women themselves. Wow, that's, that's actually amazing and uh, actually UN Women's initiatives are always very impactful on women. So, um, so thank you actually for, for sharing all this and, uh, and thank you for, thank you. Th thanks to UN Women for actually uh, doing all these great initiatives and, and having this positive impact on women. So yeah. 
Um, so, Dina, um, as a representative of the leading venture capital company in the MENA region, um, how does Flat6 Labs actually support uh, women economic empowerment through its work uh, with startups? Thank you, Nahla. It's lovely being here, uh, ladies. So, I mean, uh, at Flat6 Labs, we, I mean, it, I'll have to refer a little to Jainan um, and start by saying, Flatix Ups is in a position as an investor to come way downstream in terms of supporting uh, females. And I mean, we come exactly. after a female has been subjected to um, social norms, uh, stereotyping. In, I'm not just referring to Egypt. I think it's in the Middle East, and in many cases, it's actually a lot more global than we think. Um, and so we are in an unenviable position whereby by the time w the, our addressable market in terms of females that we can support, um, they have been subjected, unfortunately, to a lot of stereotypes similarly uh, to what Jalan was saying, like maybe mm. even in terms of education, right? So mm. it's more natural for a female to, to go into business school than she is to go to, to engineering school or STEM education. I mean, yeah. surprisingly, actually, STEM education in the Middle East is higher than the global average. But still, I mean, there is a, a, a general stereotype whereby females don't need to be ambitious, females don't need to mm -hmm. sort of earn their, their wages, females, there's all of that stereotyping and I might not have the, the, the sort of the numbers to support how much that is an issue, but it unfortunately is an issue. Mm -hmm. and, and so the truth is, is that despite the fact that we're actually very proud of Fatsik Subs that we've, I mean about 20% of the companies that we have funded are actually female-led companies, mm -hmm. we'd love that number to be a lot higher, but the problem yeah. is, is that it's actually 20% that we have funded mm -hmm. Out of 18% of the applications being females, right? So yeah. it's not that our selection is biased, it's that the applications true. much earlier to us are biased. And that's what we try to sort of fix for, that's what we try to optimize for. Mm -hmm. And so many of the things that we try to do are um, how do we create the awareness, how do we create the inspiration, how do we showcase the leading figures as females that have been able to succeed? Mm -hmm. um, how do you yourself as individuals go out and say it's actually easy, it's a lot easier yeah, there's, there's also a bit of um, myth around entrepreneurship being uh, sort of not very male oriented and these are things mm -hmm. that you can bridge the gap by saying it could actually be quite the opposite because you have the flexibility it's not about um, it's not about fixed nine to five hours you can be very flexible in terms of your care needs for example mm -hmm. because it remains to be something that is very problematic for females and, and I think motherhood is fantastic, but there is a, definitely a situation whereby there's, a, there's a un, a, 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 an unfair distribution of care uh, and family care that, that falls onto the female versus the male. Yeah. Um, and so we try to support uh, with these matters, and then eventually, once they become a portfolio company, what we try to do is, is try to eliminate the barriers and the, t towards further fundraising and, and follow-on funding. So we ourselves pay attention to how much, I mean, as flat six labs, we, we have an allocation in all of our funds towards follow-on funding, and we try very much to, to dedicate part of that towards um, companies that are female-led, even if it's not just um, a, a single founder female, but it's a group of, of founders. But more importantly, we also very much care about similar programs, such as our partnership with Organon that empowers female. And so sometimes you can support empowerment of females by, by not necessarily just supporting a female founder, mm -hmm. but also supporting a company that creates value to females, similar to, for example, our company Brimore, which might not itself be female-led, um, but in a way has created job and opportunities and economic empowerment to genuinely thousands of females sure. in Egypt, ac across all of Egypt. Yeah. Um, and so that's also something we're very proud of. And so it's baby steps, but I always say, I, I think we, we genuinely appreciate the work that organizations such as Organon and, and, and you and women do, because I think the problem is a lot more downstream than, yeah. than where we are now. That's true, fantastic. Um, well, you know, as, as you were speaking and actually as we sort of mentioned that um, women's population size is actually about half the global population size. Um, however, if you compare the employment rate, you would find that about 72% of it is actually goes to male. Um, and actually, as Dina, as you mentioned, that uh, for securing funding, we found that only about 20% of them are female-led startups, even for the applications, about 10 to 15% are, are female-led. So when it comes to entrepreneurship, 
what do you think in particular the issues that they are actually facing and the challenges that they are facing in order to secure those funding? So I think it's, it's multiple factors. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've touched upon cultural yeah. stereotypes. Um, there is also a, a, a part of the culture is female intimidation and, and, mm. and, and the work environment being already very, um, in a way, tailored around men habits. And yeah. so men are, are happy sure. to go to a, a, a bar or a cafe and sit all through the night, discuss business, whereas yeah. a female tends to yeah. sort of shy find it difficult. Yeah. They're shy. They need to go home. True. Um, and so what we try to do is, and, and so this is definitely a challenge whereby whether we realize it or not, there is a big part of the work culture mm -hmm. that revolves around men habits and men um, men sort of performance rather than female, and that can become um, a number one issue too. Mm -hmm. Females do tend to slightly be more shy, and so that they're not forthcoming, whereas investors tend to be very, um, they have very short bandwidth, probably a mm. high level of ADD, guilty of charge, <laughs> and so and so yeah. it's very difficult to have that aggressiveness that sometimes fe that sometimes males will have in terms of trying to get their attentions, whereas female wait for an opportunity mm -hmm. um, and and feel like they don't want to impose. It comes from the sense of they constantly feel they don't want to impose, yeah. um, and so that's also a definitely another something. That, and there's eventually the 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 factor whereby depending again, I mean maybe for from from my perspective, entrepreneurship tends to to very much coincide with. The Technology, mm -hmm. um, whereas I'm sure there's there's a lot more to entrepreneurship than out the one what then flat success focus, which is technology. But I think because of again the number of um, of females that come from that background, it can sometimes be a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think one of the things that I sometimes feel females a lot um, uh, suffer from a lot is finding a co-founder. And so a lot of the times we actually get. Um, a, a female founder that has a vision that might not be the tech person, but to then go and, and sort of break a barrier of finding uh, a male co-founder that would partner up with them, mm -hmm. it can sometimes be um, a bit of a challenge. And so it's it's small things which I still always say it all goes back to sort of culture and years and years of culture, sort of habits and, and, and things that are ingrained. Mm -hmm. Um, in our day, day to day. I actually totally agree with that and uh, and I actually hope that um, through our initiatives that we're going to discuss a bit more about it to be actually solving and contributing to all these challenges so yeah um, and Noha, um, when it comes to healthcare in specific um, what are the unmet needs that Organon has identified so that maybe perhaps some of our audience can think of ideas to solve and I can just give you a really interesting number kind of out of the FDA 41 products were approved okay. in 2020 mm -hmm. four were focused on women and the majority of that was female lip cancers. Mm -hmm. So if you think about R&D research, 1% only goes into conditions that are very unique to women, and that's a side of oncology, where we've seen incredible, I would say, research, a lot of advancements. Mm -hmm. um, and today, you know, we're really seeing a really big shift in how cancer is being treated. So similarly, like you said, mm -hmm. half of the world's population, but still that incredible unmet need. And I think yeah. the really great opportunity we have is really to curate a portfolio based on, on those unmet needs mm -hmm. and to direct that, that investment and funding that way. But one of the first things that we wanted to do as a company was launch more than just a company, but a commitment to listen to women mm -hmm. and really build our portfolio, build our products, our offerings mm -hmm. based on their unmet needs. So one of the yeah. things that we did uh, once we started our launch our company a little less than a year ago is we passed the virtual microphone to women all over the world. And we invited wow. them to share with us what they thought where the unmet needs are. And okay. we've heard from thousands of women, thousands. A lot of women bravely shared what they believe to be the unmet needs from their perspectives, their own experiences, what they hope to see the future generations. But there were some really common, I would say, themes that have emerged from yeah. uh, what we heard from women. A big one of them, and obviously a lot of this to our earlier conversation, yeah. is connected to COVID, which mm -hmm. we know has mm -hmm. really put a lot of pressure on women, especially if you think about that uh, burden of, uh, of care and, and, and really supporting work as well as uh, the children, home, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So yeah. one of the key things we've heard was mental health. That was mm -hmm. one of the biggest topics that came through but not in isolation, which was very interesting. Okay. It's connected to reproductive health. So the burden of certain reproductive health issues and how it impacts women. For example, mm -hmm. we know that 15% of all couples all over the world suffer from infertility. 
nobody really talks about the emotional burden that mm -hmm. takes not just on the sure. woman, but at the couple, on the couple, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So how do we then bring innovation to make it easier? And then we, when we think about innovation, you know, there's obviously the therapeutic, kind of the actual product and the R&D, but then this is where Fantech gets to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. How do we create solutions that improve the direct consumer, your consumer experience as a woman? How can we make the journey a bit easier for you? Yeah. So mental health and its re relationship to reproductive health is a big issue. But a lot of discussions are as well around the gaps around maternal health around reproductive health still exist. So even though we know that there's been a lot of innovation when it comes to contraception, I would say one of the greatest, I would say, <laughs> public or health yeah. interventions for women out there, there's still innovation in this space is a bit slow. Mm -hmm. So obviously women are talking about kind of how they are looking for tailored, I would say, recommend preferences that fit their needs. Mm -hmm. But also if you think about postpartum, experience and maternal health, we know that there are still a lot of unmet needs there. And if a woman goes through that experience, you can see that comes through in the listening. Mm -hmm. So I am, you know, we believe that this is something that has to be ongoing. It's not a one and done exercise. Yeah. So what we've done is we've launched a global platform with a virtual microphone, inviting women all over the world to share what they what they believe to be the issues so that we can keep that conversation going. Well, what was the name of that pl platform? So it's, it's here, so it's here for her help.com. We also also have a here for help manap.com mm -hmm. and we've recently also launched uh, a report with some of the recommendations and some of the themes that have emerged so I invite everybody to also take a look some really insight with insights very in there. Interesting. Yeah, yeah very interesting. interesting. Thank you. Um, well actually those are amazing ideas and I hope our audience are perhaps may, maybe taking some notes on potential ideas to become startups one day so uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and Jailan, um, from your own uh, experience, uh, and especially post-COVID uh, pandemic, um, what do you think we should actually focus on in order to create an enabling environment uh, for women to actually encourage them into the entrepreneurship field? Um, first of all, it's very fascinating what you just said. Really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, I think, um, as was mentioned earlier, COVID-19 has definitely um, exacerbated existing inequalities, including gender inequalities. And women in particular were affected because when schools closed, when daycares closed, uh, when people fell sick, it, that responsibility fell very much on women. So women mm -hmm. ended up dropping out of the workforce in order to take care of children, elderly parents, and um, you know, sick, sick family members. Um, if I were to, you know, uh, my, my, my kind of wish, I think the yeah. single most important thing is really to invest, invest in STEM education. I actually, I actually think it's okay. absolutely crucial. Yeah. Um, I think um, AI is a really important field, mm -hmm. and we've seen in Egypt um, increased attention to uh, funding uh, faculties that focus on AI in public universities. So I was mentioning earlier in Kofri Sheikh, which is great that it's not also in the city centers yeah. or in Helwan. And we find that many of the women that are enrolled in AI, uh, actually not many, sorry, what I meant to say is that the composition of the student body are predominantly women. So a lot of women are actually wow. enrolling in AI, which is really great. And when yeah. I asked why, because I was very pleasantly surprised, yeah. it affords them that flexibility to work from home, to work at around mm -hmm. the hours, and to be creative as well. So I think... Um, in terms of that kind of, uh, I think investing in STEM and investing in fields like you know artificial intelligence is, is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. From um, the women that we speak to, uh, some of the barriers they face are the ones we've known for a long time, which is uh, around access to markets. Many of them okay. um, still find it challenging to understand the market. Um, some of the women-owned businesses that we work with, they have a very strong understanding of their technical product, mm -hmm. of the issue itself, but how do you kind of you know, access the market. How do you yeah. how do you penetrate the market? How do you understand the market? So that's kind of that knowledge part yeah. is is very mm. key. They're yeah. experts in that technical topic, but mm. to make it a business, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Mentorship. But what I find with mentorship, it needs to be tailored. So you can't yeah. just bring a group of women who have nothing to do with one another and say it's a mentorship program. Sure. It needs to be you know, tied to kind of in the same field. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, a very important area. Um, companies we speak to also struggle with issues related to brand awareness and 
um, and payment gateways, which I think are really important. So many of the companies that we talk to um, say that having a payment gateway is very important and facilitates mm -hmm. their business because otherwise they're trying to chase payment themselves and it's a lot of operational work they have to do. Mm -hmm. And also co-working spaces are very important because sometimes yeah. co-working spaces actually take on the burden of a lot of the transactional operational uh, type of work that, yeah. that they would normally have to do themselves so they can focus on their business. And usually what we found is that um, the biggest challenge that women face when they're starting a, a business is not necessarily only financial. It's actually the non-financial issues. It's around huh, okay. the understanding the market or the yeah. mentorship or you know finding um, a partner mm. in addition, of course, to accessing finance, which is a big issue. So I think right. these are the kind of, from our perspective, the kind of the key kind of structural issues that we see are, are important. Yeah, yeah, that's very uh, insightful yeah. and very it useful as well. It actually coincides a lot with our experience as well. I mm. mean, we feel that a lot of females come, they have the, they have the, as in female founders, they have the work ethic, they have the energy, but they struggle sort of coming out of a comfort zone, which is the product. And the minute they have to worry about like HR and business yeah. and commercial and go to market, that's what sometimes overwhelms them. Yeah. Um, and I think they need a lot more of that. And then uh, also adding to you, Jalan, I think I realized that one of the things that female founders really appreciate mm -hmm. is having female mentors as well. They mm -hmm. feel like they can open up easier mm -hmm. um, and they can build the connection. I, I also feel that female founders and entrepreneurs tend to, and, and females at large, tend to like to have a, a more human interaction um, than a very transactional mm -hmm. form of, a, of mm -hmm. an interaction. And so having a, a female founder that they, uh, uh, sorry, a female like a men um, aiming to support women and, and ideally at the end to also contribute to the economy and to the healthcare uh, sector. Um, and, and this collaboration brings uh, a newly designed uh, program uh, called Femtech Accelerator Program. Uh, and I would like to discuss more about it. So, uh, Noha, if you could tell us why Organon um, has actually specifically decided to focus on digital healthcare um, and, um, and how Organon actually attempts to resolve those unmet needs that you were um, telling us about earlier. Yeah, so I think, if, you know, going back to kind of the idea of how innovation can really play into advancing gender equity, and I think I'm looking at this in kind of two different areas. The first mm -hmm. is kind of core to our mission, R&D, that's aside, and that's something we continue to do. But also, I think, unique partnerships like this, which bring like-minded organizations mm -hmm. that really have an interest um, and are really passionate about advancing um, gender equity, women's economic empowerment, we recognize we cannot do this on our own. Yeah. So that's Definitely. something that needs a multi-sectoral approach, needs unique and innovative partnerships, and also disruptive solutions. And I think, you know, we know that um, COVID was the single most disruptive event of <laughs> our lifetimes, yeah. um, and really has changed everything and how we do yeah. everything, really, and made us rethink what we thought would be the right way. And I think similarly, the policy solutions or solutions we thought about yesterday or pre-COVID need to be revisited today. Mm. And I think we all know that you know we are at this crossroads. We could really undo precious gains or we could move forward and accelerate. Mm. Yeah. So one of the things that we, you know, obviously as a I would say a positive byproduct of COVID was, you know, really how we've seen an acceleration of uptake in digital health solutions. Mm -hmm. And one of the rising, I would say, industries now is the femtech, so femtech industry. Yeah. And obviously, we've see, we're seeing this, I think, as a result of kind of the amplification and increased focus on advancing gender equity at a global level, but also mm -hmm. recognizing that that 50% yeah. underserved population is a huge market opportunity as well, yeah. and that there could be really great um, solutions yeah. to serve uh, those women out there. So uh, just to kind of redefine, so what is Femtech? Femtech is basically a new term uh, derived, I think, around 2006, um, which really looks at the application of digital technologies to address women's health. And that could mm -hmm. come in a variety of ways, right? So it could be something um, around, you know, diagnosis, it could be a wearable, it could be an application on the mobile, it could be a, a variety of different things, but it includes those two different components. So one, okay. digital technology and how do we apply that to support women's health. Okay. And it's really interesting to see the number, I think there was a really interesting McKinsey study that looked at 
the pickup, not just in investing, but how much people are talking about femtech. And really for us, this was really interesting to see that rise in innovation. And we believe that it could be a really good opportunity to address on that needs. But also, again, the women's health gender equity piece, supporting women, you know, and the power of representation, women who are creating solution solutions for women. But also we are, again, not just exclusively looking at women-led businesses, but those that are targeting women, uh, women's health issues. So, yeah. uh, you know, when you think about the industry, again, I think around the numbers were around 2020, we were around $20.2 billion as an industry. Mm -hmm. It's going to be around 60 billion in 2026. So we're seeing that wow. growth happen, yeah. which means that there's a lot of movement. And likewise, there are investors now that are just focused exclusively on women's health or women-led businesses, which I think is, is really great to see. So when you think about femtech, um, you know, and I'll get to the program in a minute, mm -hmm. you know, there are a number of things that you think about when we're looking at femtech is really it has the opportunity to not just address unmet needs, mm -hmm. but to address stigma. It gives you that tailored approach. So going back to the, what we heard from women, they want to feel like they're tailoring solutions to them. So the idea of self-care, whether that's through your wearables or your trackers, you know, how do you customize your care and understanding yourself better so that you can take right. charge of your own health? Um, diagnosis and improving diagnosis, and we're seeing really interesting innovations in this space. So again, going back to how do we improve outcomes and healthcare outcomes, but also how do we improve the overall experience of women with healthcare delivery bring it even to her own home. So a lot of exciting uh, innovations happening there. Obviously through the program, like Dr. Jairan was just saying, yeah. we recognize as well that women have unique needs, right? So yeah. how can we tailor a program with that in mind? So how can we provide them with the mentoring, with the coaching, with if they are technical experts, how can we also add on our experience as well and the experience of experts and really connect them together? Mm -hmm. You know, recognizing that women, like you said, are, are maybe a bit more reserved. How can we create sure. that enabling environment so that they have all the tools that they need to be successful? And we're really excited to see, I think we're around 150 applications so far, so very exciting to see that in a variety of topics. So we're really excited to take it to the next stage. And obviously we're looking for innovative, creative, scalable solutions that mm -hmm. um, are focused on women's health. And really excited to, to kind of take it to the next stage, you know, beyond, um, I would say the application process, to mm -hmm. the boot camp um, and uh, hopefully then uh, support the finalists with, with seed funds as well. That's perfect. And um, actually, I'm, I'm looking forward to actually measuring the impact of that program because it sounds um, interesting to be delivering all those um, uh, offerings to, to the startups and, and to female um, in specific, the females in specific. So um, looking forward to that. <laughs> um, so Jaylan, um, if you could tell us more about um, UN Women Partnerships. So um, I think um, UN Women actually partners with the private sector and, and perhaps with even ac other uh, sort of actors to support um, and empower women. So could you tell us more about this uh, sort of partnerships? Of course. Um, so by virtue of being the UN, our focus is very much on what we call the leave no one behind, the women that are yeah. uh, facing multiple forms of um, discrimination. So um, we work, um, I would say, um, the economic pyramid. So women at the base of the economic pyramid would be one of our biggest target group. Mm -hmm. um, those women are predominantly working informally uh, without the protection of the labor law or any type of social protection. Mm -hmm. And we, um, our biggest job is really around financial uh, security and financial inclusion. So we have yeah. a major program with the Central Bank of Egypt and the National Council for Women that mobilizes tens of thousands of women to join digital savings groups. Um, women's savings groups are very familiar in the culturally speaking. The difference from the traditional gamaya is that they save together, yeah. they lend each other from those savings, but there is an interest on the shares. Oh, so okay. it's also like a nano bank and a yeah. microcredit form of uh, uh, savings and microcredit. Oh. And um, we've introduced a digital application that digitizes the internal transactions of the group 
and connects them to the bank. So we provide them with uh, the MISA national payment card mm -hmm. and with mm -hmm. those that don't have identification cards, also in partnership with the government, access to ID cards mm -hmm. to connect them to the bank. We also support women through digital financial services to become banking agents as well, which provides them with a supplementary form of income. Yeah. and also helps women that have to, due to social norms, that they're not able to be more mobile to basically pay for utilities and bills. So, hmm. I mean, that's kind of the women at the base of the economic pyramid. We work on gender-responsive procurement. Um, we have a very successful project with P&G. Uh, P&G approached us and they were interested to diversify their supply chain and they wanted to introduce more women-owned businesses both as uh, distributors of PNG products, but also as suppliers. So we have worked on a very successful um, a partnership that has actually been extended several times in uh, really uh, integrating women-owned businesses. So initially, though, they were not uh, formalized. We helped formalize those women-owned businesses, and they're now distributors of PNG plus other companies. Mm -hmm. So other multinational companies, when they saw how successful this was, they also came on board, and now those women are also distributing, going door to door uh, and also helping multinationals access new markets they wouldn't normally be able to access basically yeah. because they go to the very very small villages and hamlets and knock on the door and you know so it's a win-win situation for both the company and the women um, we have our flagship um, initiative which is the women's empowerment principle which is a global um, initiative that is a partnership between UN women and the UN global compact it's a mm -hmm. set of seven uh, principles that really very very in a very structured way helps companies um, analyze their policies and practices to see how they can make them more gender responsive um, they look at issues like leadership and supply chain and marketing and uh, training and awareness and we as UN Women, we help the company basically undertake uh, an internal self-assessment based on um, the, the, the seven principles to mm -hmm. develop an action plan with the company, what they see as a priority, um, whether it's, for instance, integrating more women in their supply chain, whether it's marketing, whether it's training and promotion, uh, whether it's family-friendly policies, and we provide them with these kind of technical support um, to enable them to basically, um, and we've noticed that recently um, when the, uh, the, it's now mandated to when you, when you, in your, if companies are listed as part of your uh, ESG. Yeah, so this is just uh, very briefly some of the work that we do. That's very interesting, but uh, can you also maybe share uh, briefly um, about ESG and what is it about uh, as well? Uh, to our audience? Yeah. Um, ESG is economic, social, and governance. And right. when companies are listed, for example, they um, in, in, in stock exchanges, they have to also disclose um, those metrics. Yeah. So not just their financial bottom line performance, but also how are they performing when it comes to governance, social, and environmental uh, metrics as well. So under the social metrics, yeah. there's a lot of attention to women's empowerment and gender equality. So the WEPS is a way, by signing the WEPS and implementing the WEPS, it helps them um, kind of report on this mandatory yes, uh, exactly. reporting. So uh, it can be self-driven, but of course, if it's also mandated, then companies are much more likely to, to take yeah. them on board. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for explaining this because um, I, I sort of wanted to emphasize on ESG as well because so many startups may not be considering it and, and it's actually very important uh, for them to be aware of this side of uh, perspective. So, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and uh, Dina, when it comes to um, financial institutions, um, could you tell us their role in supporting women and perhaps even the healthcare sector? Um, and, and what are they doing to actually support uh, those two? Thank you, Nahla. So I, I just want to, before I answer that, I want to go to Jailen and say that we actually, two of the companies that I mentioned are doing very similar um, and mm -hmm. they're technology enabled. It's uh, Brimore, which mm -hmm. is also a, pla a distribution platform, mm -hmm. but then there's also Money Fellows, which, which digitizes the Rosca model or the rotating, yeah. um, the, the very, the very, traditional Gamaya, they've digitized it. And Gamaya is a, is a very typical way of how females in Egypt sort of save or yeah, try yeah. to sort of create financial uh, means. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think what I was trying to say is that technology is a huge enabler. And, mm -hmm. and maybe I don't come from necessarily from a technology background, but, uh, but technology is a huge way to try and support female 
um, and try to bridge gaps faster. And I think that's part of part of the whole point of having that conversation and, and building that pro that program with Oregon on is I think that there's there's been a lag and and I think focusing on female health has lagged for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and the best way to do it now is to seek those um, digital innovations to try and support them. But how do financial institutions at large support females? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it, I mean, financial institutions are, are multiple levels, right? So if you look at us as VCs, we are a financial institution, but we're funded by financial institutions, and then we eventually ourselves fund other institutions. True. Um, and so um, there's a there's a there's a well recognized term. I mean, Jailan again uh, mentioned ESG, which is something that all of our LPs, our limited partners, or our, our funding institutions are very keen, and we as Plastic Subs always report on. And once you have that in your mandate, once you have that in sort of in your um, in your DNA, yep. it becomes very keen into how financial institutions look at at opportunities and investments and then that creates um, the drive to support more females um, and then there's also one of the biggest sort of subsections of ESG which is now very very familiar and requested um, mm -hmm. and looked upon and, and sought by investors is the is the notion of gender lens investing exactly. um, and gender lens investing does isn't just about female founders it's mm -hmm. about any opportunity or any solution or any th that supports a female yeah, or yeah. empowers a female um, and so Brie Moore would fall under that um, yeah. a health tech that that empowers a female or supports female would fall under that even if the founder is is, is not is not, not, yeah. is not this female. is gender lens investing so, actually what yeah. you do it's yes. very exactly, much yeah. exactly investing with a gender lens yeah. Yeah. so so that exactly and so and so this has become um, something of huge focus and, and I wouldn't say as of late but and, and even then it's I think it's late it's Something that's been happening for a while, um, but I think that's just us, or that's the world. I think an investor's reaction into trying to say, mm -hmm. right, we cannot create more financial returns. I mean, flat six hours at the end of the day, and I think investors. Um, they are return seeking. I mean, so sure. whereas there's certain organizations at the UN that does it for the for the embetterment of the of the entire <laughs> system, yeah. there is a. Sure. But but even that, I think, is actually valuable because again, referring to Jailan, it's all about creating financial sustainability. Because mm -hmm. you because I think what investors have realized is that with the empower with with the background of them seeking returns, they invest into females and empower females that can be sustainable, create mm -hmm. economic returns, and so from that be able to empower other females and then create that sort of self-feeding cycle of empowerment and returns and so mm. I think the intersection of being return centric but also but also impact um, seeking yeah. creates that really fantastic uh, opportunity effect, of yeah. ripple yeah. effect whereby you know like if you if you give me food today I'll eat it and it's done but if you teach me how to fish no, then I can true. I can do that for the rest of my life yeah. and so I think that is the huge role on financial institutions is mm -hmm. is to unlock the economic uh, value that is currently very dormant through um, because the number of females that are not being engaged. Interesting. Yeah, and I'll just add, yeah. I think what's really interesting is to see even, you know, like you said, financial institutions take on that gender lens, right? Mm -hmm. And we're seeing, you know, the, the uh, recently, I would say the new gen gender bonds and we're seeing systemic. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, how are we accelerating? And like you said, mm -hmm. you know, can really help unlock a lot of opportunities. I would say it also has, you know, investing in women, and like you said, hopefully we get into that 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 cycle. But it also has a multiplier effect. And mm -hmm. I think that's great that that level of awareness is now, you know, really being part of all different sectors, uh, whether it's you know, on the financial institutions, private sector, multilaterals. Um, um, because again, we, mm -hmm. we can we cannot one sector cannot make a difference on their own. So. Multi-stakeholder, as you said, yeah. right approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So we, we look forward to seeing the graduates of, uh, of the Same Oregon or Practice yes, Apps program exactly. and, and hopefully invest in, in most of them yeah. as Plastic mm -hmm. Labs. And um, actually, um, I think this is a very um, smart and strategic collaboration between the organizations to be able to serve those unmet needs and, and females in general. So, uh, so definitely looking forward to its launch soon. Yeah. Um, so I would like to uh, just give a brief uh, to our audience about the program uh, so that um, would encourage you to actually apply because it's very um, interesting program and it's actually 
a newly designed program dedicated for um, uh, female health issues and the digital health sector in general. Uh, so basically, um, if your idea, um, if your startup stage is from idea stage to MVP, you can apply. Um, uh, the when it comes to gender, uh, whether it comes to female led or male led, it doesn't really matter. Just what matters is you're actually trying to solve um, a health issue using digital or using technology and with preference to focusing on women uh, health issues uh, in specific. Um, and uh, for the region, um, actually the program is a global uh, program, so anyone from any region can actually apply and uh, hopefully uh, you would actually join. And then there is also um, a potential for investment at the end uh, of the program so that it would give an incentive for the uh, startups to be able to launch their, um, their startups successfully into the market. Um, actually I actually cannot believe that uh, we're, we're almost wrapping up our panel discussion and it was actually very interesting and very delightful. So um, uh, I just wanted to ask one, one more question to you uh, all. If, um, if you could tell me 10 years from now, um, where do you hope uh, to see women uh, sort of last minute message for, for them as well? So we're, we're going to start with you, Noha. Um, you know, I hope that in 10 years time, obviously I have a young daughter, so I hope that <laughs> You know, as she grows older and she explores um, her opportunities, that she hopefully we see those barriers. I think go down a bit, and that she yeah. has equal access to equal opportunities. Yeah. I think we all know kind of the um, the biases that are out there and some of the the challenges. So you know, would love to see them. Um, I don't think we're going to remove them completely, but mm -hmm. I'd love to see that we're making some progress. I think the focus that we're seeing and seeing more of a global movement. Uh, yeah. There, so in ten years' time, to see that that effort done, and hopefully by twenty thirty, we um, make some good strides when it comes to our SDG goals as yeah. well. Hopefully, yeah. And do you know? I, I mean, I, I guess as an investor, I can only hope for the for the next uh, female-led unicorn out of the middle. Oh wow! Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the top side. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to the point. Yeah. Um, I think. Um, Technology is, is rapidly uh, displacing many jobs, specifically women's jobs. You mm -hmm. see, like you go to supermarkets in the U.S. where a lot of time the, the jobs that women would be doing in terms of like as a cashier, for mm -hmm. example, are being done by technology. So I think we really need to invest in technology for women, yeah. in technology education, tech schools for women. I think that's in 10 years from now, I really hope to see more you know, young women uh, entering into tech fields and um, yeah, and and just staying the course. Um, yeah, that would be my ambition for ten years from yeah. now. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, ladies. It was uh, amazing. Uh, I, I actually felt um, there is great hope, and uh, and I was very delighted to be moderating this uh, great panel with you all. And um, for everyone, I would like to thank you for, for watching, and I hope you uh, have enjoyed this panel discussion as much as we did. Uh, just final reminder that uh, applications uh, for the FinTech Accelerator program is open, and uh, you can apply through uh, Fatsix Labs uh, website. Uh, the deadline is uh, 30th of April, so it's the end of this month, and I wish you all the best and good luck. Thank you. Thank you.